What's up everybody? My name's Jeff and we're so stoked you're here today. Here's a couple upcoming events around the church you might wanna know about. If you drove to church and parked your car in the lot, got a cup of coffee, or walked your child into one of our children's ministries, you've already experienced some of our amazing volunteers. Getting involved on a volunteer team is one of the best ways to make Port City feel like home. We're always excited to offer opportunities for people to get plugged in and begin serving in a role they love, whether that's on a Sunday or another time during the week. If you're interested in learning more ways you can become a volunteer, swing by what's next. One of the things we know around here is that we all need to belong and to be known. Around PC3, we are passionate about forming social connections that are centered around the person of Jesus. Because of this, we place a high value on community. We learn in groups, we grow in groups, and we serve in groups. Groups can be organized around common interests, seasons of life, or to discuss biblical topics. We would love to help you become a part of Christ-centered community. So if you'd like to find out more about the groups we offer, stop by what's next after the service. Ladies, it's not too late to register for the two-day women's conference coming up March 1st and 2nd. Bianca Oltoff will be sharing two days of inspiration where you're sure to have fun and build some authentic community. You can register online at portcitychurch.org forward slash women. Thanks for being with us today. We are so excited to share our Sunday with you. My name is Caleb, and this is Courtney and the band, and we are so excited to be with you guys this morning. Mike is going to finish up his last uh, message of the series, Forged. We're going to worship together, and it's just going to be a great day as a church body, so I just invite you to stand and sing with us. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet.
declare this. You moved the mountain and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way and I believe I'll see you do it again. We're going to sing a new song we've been learning recently, just singing about how big God is, that He is bigger than we thought He was. And that's something I just love about God. When we think we haven't figured, figured out, we don't. He's infinite. He's all-knowing. And we'll spend the rest of our lives and the rest of eternity getting to know Him, getting to understand Him. And still, we won't even touch the surface. So as we sing this, I just want to encourage you to press in to the fact that God is so big, no matter what you're walking through or facing, He's bigger than we think. So let's sing this together. Speak to me when the silence steals my voice. You understand me. You understand me. Come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me, God. You understand me. So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought So I stop all negotiations With the God of all creation You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought you were
father's hand I will rest in the father's hand and leave the rest in the father's hand so I throw all my cares before you my doubts and fears don't scare you you're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought So I stop all negotiation With the God of all creation You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought you were
Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your love. We're so thankful that you reached out to us first, that your love is elective, that you've chosen us. And through that chosen reality, that you, we are adopted and that you have this majestic fatherhood over us. God, how big you are. How great you are. I pray that as we kind of set our minds on this, that we'd be able to see how big and how great you are because that is what fuels true worship. That is what fuels worship in truth and in spirit. It's not what we do during worship. It's our hearts. It's where our hearts are at. And God, I pray that we would just turn our hearts towards you, that we would be able to see how big, how great you are, that you are over every single one of us. You are sovereign, Lord. You are majestic. God, would we not walk this earth and put you in a box? Would you just break the boxes down and show us how great you are, how big you are? And all fear will flee because of that. And so, Jesus, I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Courtney and Caleb. Um, and so last week, we um, got to introduce to you that song that Caleb led. And there you go. It's called Bigger Than I Thought. And I love that, um, that right now it's kind of a, an anthem for some of us. Um, all of our of our guys went to Passion. Y'all sang in a bunch at Passion and we've um, done the last two weeks. But I love, I love that because I love in that song, the invitation that is what I think a lot of us need to hear. What I need to hear is that Jesus invites us to bring our cares and lay them down at his feet. And even though we may be walking through a valley of unknown, that um, our doubts, Jesus is not scared of. Our fears, that he's not scared of those either. But he is way bigger than all of that. He's way bigger than we ever thought he was. And I need to be reminded about that. And I love that we're singing that right now. And uh, to be honest with you though, last week when I shared with you a little bit about that song, I didn't give you the full story of why that song is such an anthem in my heart right now. Um, and I'd love to, to do that because uh, today is, um, is a day that I hadn't really thought I would be experiencing for a long time to come because God has allowed um, myself and my family to walk into and up to and into the Valley of Unknown here recently. And through um, a lot of negotiating, with the God of creation, through a lot of prayer, through a lot of um, wrestling with God and some wrestling with myself, have come to like make this really hard and difficult decision to step down from um, my leadership role here at Port City. And after 19, 19 almost 20 years of leading here to resign from um, our pastoral role here, and when I say that God has led us to the valley of unknown, um, we're, we're in it and we are not through it. We're in the middle of it. And um, just so you know, um, I'm not sick. Nobody's dying. My marriage is awesome. My wife is amazing. She's been such a support through this. But we, um, we are in the middle of that. And when I, hear, when I hear us, when I hear you, I'm my family, my church family singing together, this commitment that we're going to, um, we're gonna rest in our Father's hands and we're gonna leave the rest in our Father's hands. That is real life for us today. Because we don't know what's next. We don't know what God's leading us towards in the future. 
But we know that's where he has us and he's holding us. And I just wanted you, my church family, to be a part of that story today. You deserve that. About a year ago, God began teaching us and showing us, my wife and I, about our identity. We're talking about that today. We're wrapping up our identity today. And um, he began showing us and teaching us that it's really, really easy for my identity to get wrapped into what I do here. You know, right now I'm, I'm holding the mic, the lights are on me, you're looking at me, and it's easy for let, to let that shape my identity. And he began challenging us that, and, and really peeling that away from our true self, our true identity, as he's called us his beloved. And he reminded us that the thing that's unique to us, the identity that's unique only to me is I'm a child of God, I'm a husband, to my wife, Cindy, and I'm a daddy to my three amazing kids. And that's it. And everything else past that is just kind of bonus. And little did I know that through the course of being challenged in that, that we would be at this point today, opening our hands up and laying this down. And um, it gives us in the middle of our sadness, in the middle of our fear, it gives us a lot of grace and reassurance to know that we are resting in our Father's hands. We have a few more weeks here um, with you guys. Um, we'll be sharing our last Sunday with all of you on March the 3rd. And believe me, every moment, um, I have been cherishing every moment and will continue to cherish every moment that I have with uh, a lot of you um, before, during, after services. And I look forward to um, sharing a few more together with you. I could probably keep talking. I'm just gonna get messy in a minute if I do. What I'd love for us to do is, um, cause I know that I, as real as this story is for us right now, that we are not the only ones in the room today who are walking through unknown. I know some of you who are here who you are on a journey that seems impassable and your doubts and your fears are way bigger than mine. And I think it's real important for us to, it's important for me and I feel it's important for you also to move our eyes above all of that and to look into the eyes of our heavenly father who has said, lay him down right here. And that's what I would love for us to do one last time. I'd love for Caleb and Courtney to come out and maybe let's just in this posture of prayer, right where we're sitting, just to let this be another reminder through prayer that we're gonna rest in our Father's hands and leave the rest in His hands. And so we're gonna end our time together. And now we'll rest in the Father's hands Leave the rest in the Father's hand. I will rest in the Father's hand. And leave the rest in the Father's hand. So I throw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought So I stop all negotiations With the God of all creation You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought Jesus, we just rest in you tonight. God, we rest in you. We know that that's a safe place to be in the hands of our Heavenly Father. God, you know each and every one of us, every detail of our story, of our lives. God, and you know all that's to come. So Lord, we just set everything at your feet we set everything in your hands, God, and we just rest there, knowing full well that you're going to take good care of us. 
Father, we pray in Jesus' name. As we um, you know, continue our service, I, I wanted to, before our, our, our host team comes, just to take a moment. Uh, I think it takes a lot of courage uh, for what Chris did. It's a, it's a significant um, transition, a significant decision for both he and his family, for our family, for our church. And I think it is uh, completely appropriate um, to recognize that and how, how hard it is uh, for all of us as we walk through and hold what God has entrusted us with, um, with open hands. But it's also a reminder of how critical that is uh, and particularly for what we're gonna be talking about today. So if you'll join me um, as, we, as we pray for uh, him and for them and for us as we continue to uh, you know, move into this, uh, into this next season. Uh, Father, we, we come to you and just as uh, we were reminded that you are faithful to us and we just want to um, just lift up Chris and Cindy, uh, their family, all of our church family as we um, walk into this, that there's a level of uncertainty that exists that you are absolutely okay with, that you allow us and you call us to live by faith. I pray that you would just give that in abundance. That would be such that there is... Um, just full measure uh, received from you in the life that you promise and the identity that we um, have been given by you. Father, I thank you for the truth of that, that you're bigger than we can even imagine and you um, hold all of this uh, in a way that allows us to be full and to be free. And we long for that, we ask for that, we pray for that in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Uh, I'm gonna invite our host team to come down now and then we'll be, uh, come back out in just a minute. We will wrap up our series called Forge. I'll see you guys in just a minute. Good morning. We welcome all of our campuses uh, together as we uh, wrap up this series. I'm actually very uh, excited about uh, wrapping up this series for a couple of reasons. Um, it's one of those things that's kind of, you get a, a story or something that hits you. Um, it's been about a month uh, or so ago and this story hit me. and I thought, this is, this is such a, a perfect moment and I wanna um, be able to share that, but also to talk about um, in a way that I think helps us understand this call or what God has done to give us identity. The second reason is um, we're gonna be closing with a song that I have been uh, in, my, in my head and heart and on repeat for about, uh, probably about a year and a half, maybe two years now. And um, there are very few songs that make me cry. Uh, and uh, I remember back uh, in the glory days, um, every rose has its thorn made me cry. Um, <laughs> A few years ago, I was, um, we were dancing in the living room with my girls listening to Taylor Swift. And I was singing um, the song, mine, you are the best thing that's ever been mine, right? She goes out in the street, he's gonna break up, but he chooses her and says, you're the best thing that's been mine. And I found like a tear coming up my eye for some reason. Like, oh, wow, this is, this is kind of embarrassing. Taylor Swift made me cry. 
And the song we're gonna uh, share with you today um, is one of those songs that just brings tears to my eyes when I think about what it is that God has done for us. Now, one of the things that we need to be reminded of, and there are pointed reminders all on the way, whether they're uh, internal with our own worlds, with our families, with our circumstances, with our uh, school jobs, whatever it might be. Um, whenever we start asking God to change us, what you have to recognize is that change comes with change. We want to be different. We want things to be different. It's going to mean that things are going to be different. And we resist that a lot more than we think we do. This is why this idea of understanding our identity is so critical in what it is that God longs to do in and through you. It, it's absolutely essential for that. And what we've been talking about, and I'm going to sort of uh, use this, that whenever we start thinking about um, the future, one of the big things that comes up is we talk about vision. We talk about vision. And you know, I'm kind of a vision guy, so I, I often think in terms of vision and such, but there's sort of these two points. And we're gonna talk about this. There's the here and there's the now, which exist in the here and now. And then there's the there and the then. This is what happens when these things we hope for become true. This is some place over there. We gotta navigate this space in between them. What we've been saying over the last couple of weeks is we've talked about this, this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which says to do your very best, to be zealous, to be eager, to work really hard, to present yourself to God, to come before Him as one who has already been approved. This is an important word we were talking about. As one who is already approved. This means that there's gonna be a threat that we don't come to Him already approved. We come to Him making our case. We come to Him trying to say, God, here's why you should do this or here's why I'm not as bad as you think or here's why all these things. We make our case. We feel like we have to prove ourselves to Him. He says, no, you gotta let all that go and come to Him as one who has already been made approved. And then He adds this next thing, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. This is important. Because oftentimes this is a lot of the motivator for us to do things for God. We feel bad about the things we haven't done for God or the situations we've gotten ourselves in. And so we come with a lot of shame, a lot of baggage. He says, come approved, one who does not need to be ashamed. So you gotta have these two things in your head. Then the next thing he says, rightly handling the word of truth. And we've talked about this the last five weeks. If you were not here, uh, I encourage you to go back and listen. I think it'll be helpful. But he says that we are to rightly handle the word of truth. And I'm gonna use the word here, obey. This is a really important word, not because God is trying to get you to comply with his moral standard, but it's important to understand because we understand what God's word does. God word, God's word creates life. When you are obedient to him, when you obey him, what he is actually doing is he is creating in you this new creation that you have already been made to be. It's the process by which you become who you are is in a relationship with Him, is walking with Him. Our identity is sealed in a promise. It is forged in the context of a relationship. This is the last few weeks we've talked about this together. So today I wanna to sort of turn the corner. I wanna ask you, I wanna to talk to us together about what is it that threatens our identity? What threatens it? Like it's easy to get it here. Sometimes it's easy, and easy, to, easy to get it here, but how do we live this out day in and day out throughout the circumstances that our lives bring our way. So a couple of things you need to know about. Uh, number one is that I believe we see through the lens of the thing that we want the most. When we look out into the future, when we look out in the future, we typically view the world through the thing that we want the most right here, right now. When I was 16, all I ever wanted was a Jeep. That's what I wanted my whole, like, from 16 on a Jeep Wrangler. And um, I, I'm, I'm 48 years old. I don't want a Jeep anymore. I mean, I would, but I don't, I don't, I'm not obsessed with it anymore. I'm, I'm fine. I got an 89 Volvo. I like driving. It's totally cool. So don't, don't ask me want to buy your Jeep. I don't. But here's what would happen. Um, you start about every three or four years, you start going, man, I need a new car. I need a new car. And what do you start doing? You got your phone or your computer. You start Craigslist. You're looking for Jeeps. You're looking for, oh, there's a good Jeep. Oh, there's a good Jeep. About three or four days of looking for Jeeps. And you're like, Jeep, 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 Jeep. Then you go out and you're driving around. And guess what? Everybody's driving. Everybody's driving a Jeep. Then you come to God. God, everybody else has a Jeep. Why can't I have a Jeep? And the truth is no more people are driving Jeeps than we're driving Jeeps three or four days before. Then the problem is I'm just seeing the world through the thing that I want the most. And that's what happens to us. The other thing that happens is we feel the world or experience the world through the strongest emotion that we tend to hold on to. 
And for a lot of us, that's why we live in such fear because what's happened to us is what we see here and now. The thing that we are starting to demand right here and now is actually framing our view for the future. That all the things that you're afraid you're not gonna have, all the things that aren't gonna go right, all the things that might threaten it going right, all the things that could go wrong, might go wrong, will go wrong, all those things are now framing this overwhelming sense of fear and it frames the way we experience the here and now because it's what we perceive about the future. We've allowed what's happening right here in front of us, right, to frame the way we see something. What we've got to do is we've got to begin to reverse that. We've got to see something a little bit differently. We've got to begin to see something that compels us towards this place. And what I want to submit to you is that this might not be a place like you're thinking. It's not a hill we're going to take or a thing we're going to climb. It's not some place we're getting to when everybody gets along and we sing Kumbaya. There might be something else to this. And that's what I want to explore. The vision might not be a compelling view of the future. It might be an accurate view of who you've already been made to be. So um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Madison, she's 23 now, she's married. Um, actually, when she's being, uh, being a father-in-law and having a daughter who's married, is actually really fun because I see all the things that Madison used to do to me, she now does to her husband. And I'm like, I did the best I could, man. I did the best I could. At, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Madison is, is unbelievably tenacious. She is sweet as she can be, pretty. She's, she's, and obviously I'm, I'm her dad, I'm biased. But if you know her, you know I'm telling the truth, right? And, um, but she is tenacious. I, I, I refer to her because she's not stubborn. But she's tenacious, so maybe she's graciously stubborn. Maybe that's a good way to describe her. But if she gets her mind on something, man, she's going to do it. And this has been this way since she was a kid. And so uh, it doesn't matter what it is. We'd be out surfing waves and she can't, you know, it's, it's, the waves are big. I'm like, hey, babe, listen, I can't help you. So I'm going out and, and if you can't get there, just I'll meet you on the beach. And I'll be out there looking and I'll look on the shore and see and, you know, can't find her. She's like 13 years old, can't find her. I'm like, oh my gosh, where's she at? And out there paddle around trying to see on the beach. All of a sudden here she comes over that last set waves. You know, she just beat herself to death to get out there and made it. She just won't quit. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I think it was about two years ago, she decided she was going to uh, try and uh, do the Whole30 diet. Now, I don't know if you know what the Whole30 diet is, but Whole30 is basically where you can't eat anything good for 30 days. Um, <laughs> your body freaks out, can't have sugar, you can't have anything, cream, dairy. It's, 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 I said, man, my version of a Whole30 diet is I'm gonna eat the whole bag of Oreos in 30 minutes, man. Give me a Whole30 all day. <laughs> But she gets in and she reads all about it and she, she's got it all down and she's listening to it. And she's, you know, well, she starts in. And so first couple of days, she's it's no big deal. And so we were being at dinner or at the house eating something. And she goes, I can't eat that. And I can't eat that. And I can't have that. And she would go, I am no victim. It's like, <laughs> okay. And so she would dinner later on. It's like, I can't have that. I can't have that. She would start complaining about this. She goes, I am no victim. I live with vision. I'm like, that is the most cornball thing I've ever heard anybody say on a diet. I've heard lots of people trying to beat their, you know, bring their bodies into submission and, and eat right and all that stuff, but I've never heard anybody say, I am no victim. <laughs> so I said, what is this? She said, oh, dad, it's a song. You gotta hear it. So she sends me the Spotify link. I am no victim. And I'm going, what kind of dumb name for a song is that? I mean, it started off bad. I'm like, okay, a song called I am no victim. So I'm gonna listen to it. It says, I am no victim. I live with a vision. I'm covered by the force of love, covered in my Savior's blood. I am no poor man. I'm not an orphan. The kingdoms now become my own. And with the King, I found a home. He is my Father. I do not wonder if His plans for me are good or if He'll come through like you should. I am no victim. I live with a vision. I began to think, oh, wow. It began to give a picture for the single most significant relationship that I can have or you can have, and that is the relationship with the Father. And here's how you know this to be true if you're not sure about what you believe about God. In this world, everything is sort of demonstrated. It's a shadow of what is to come. My role as a father for my kids is only a shadow of God's fatherhood for them. And so when you think about our culture and what's happening in our culture and the, you talk to anybody and all the struggles, people will start talking about the fact there's this absence of fatherhood, the absence of fathers, all these things. Do you know why? Because it is the most significant relationship that we can have. 
Not necessarily the one with your earthly dad, that's, that's important. But the relationship with your heavenly father, this is exactly why Jesus came, is to restore you into a relationship with your father. Remember he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father, but through me. To be able to have a picture of that, to be able to have a vision for that, that allows everything else not to be a threat to you is the way you say, I am no victim. I live with a vision. I have a feeling that a lot of folks, probably in this room, gathered in our rooms and with the sound of my voice, your life is marked by being a victim. Your identity is marked by being a victim, by the things that have happened to you. Some of you, it's the things you've done to yourself. It's the, you say, I'm a victim of my circumstances. And we have all the reasons why we're not doing the things that we ought to be doing or we should be doing. We're not where we ought to be. We have all kinds of reasons for that. It's really interesting that human beings, we love excuses, right? I don't know if you've picked up on this or not. We love to have a reason why we're not where we ought to be. And interestingly enough, the way I wrote this down is that if you have an excuse, you will likely use it. In fact, I thought about doing it this way. I thought about bringing a basketball goal up here, bringing a basketball goal and putting it right here uh, 10 foot. And then getting someone from the audience, someone from our congregation who used to play basketball and used to be good at basketball uh, and bring them up here and let them shoot a free throw from about right here. And here's what would probably happen. They would get up here and they would go. It's been a really long time since I shot a basketball. You know, I used to be really good. I was 85% free throw shooter in high school back when I was good. I've had a few injuries, a little knee surgery, tight hammy. Boom. But we're going to just shoot the ball already, right? <laughs> Do you know what he's doing? He's preparing us for when he misses. When he goes, doink, he's going, oh man, that hammy's really bothering me on this, right? We start hedging our bets out of the gate. I mean, I hear this all the time. People say, well, Mike, you know, I'm not this or I'm not that. I know you're asking. I'm not sure, but we have, we have all the reasons why we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. If there's any character I relate to in the Bible, mostly it's Moses. The first thing that Moses did when God called him was Moses gave him all the reasons why God shouldn't call him. That's what I did. No, God, you got the wrong. I'm really good at architecture and I wanna be really rich. And these two things don't go together. Let me tell you all the reasons you shouldn't get me to do this. And I got a lot of them. And we start giving out, we we wanna hedge our bets. Now it's one thing when it's a God, but it's another thing when it's your marriage, when it's your kids, when it's your job, when it's your call. The things that God has asked of you. And what we try to do is we sit back and we try to figure things out. And then we ask God to do things according to the things that we've figured out. And we start to undermine what he's actually asked us to do. And we end up living as a victim to all the things that we can't or shouldn't or wouldn't or should have or whatever. All those things begin to be the defining factor in how we live our lives. It's interesting, a lot of great things about Jesus. And one thing I would, I would suggest to you, uh, encourage you, charge you, is spend some time reading the Gospels. I was gonna say, if you have time, I wouldn't even say if you have time, I would make time to read the Gospels. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People project a lot of things on Jesus that Jesus never said, nor did he do, simply because they're thinking about something they might have heard about him from somewhere else. Read the Gospels and you'll get to see exactly what he did. He was always sort of at odds with the religious leaders of the day. Not because he was an antagonist, but because what he was doing was so threatening to the world they had created. And so anything that was seen as a threat to their control or their way of life was just resisted. And that's not unlike us. We have different rules and different things and different views that we do that by, but it's never less the same. Jesus confronts those, not because he's trying to give us the right system of living, because he's teaching us and drawing us into the life that we have been made to live. It's one of the stories, and there's, there's a, uh, so many in here that I really love, is the way Jesus interacted with people, particularly when they would ask questions or when he would confront some particular issue. What we see in Genesis chapter five, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter five, that would be awesome if Jesus was there. I mean, he is, but not literally. John chapter five. 
Um, a lot of Samaritans are beginning to believe in Jesus. He's been teaching and a lot of people from all, so the, the Jewish people were very like, we want to make sure that it's, it's us. We're the chosen people and everybody else. And if there was so much racial tension between the Samaritans and the Jewish people, so Samaritans are starting to believe they're becoming Christians. There's actually a lot of influence in Jerusalem from, the, from Greek and all kinds of different places that are happening. And so the, the control under Roman rule that, um, that the Jewish uh, uh, sort of religious leaders had experienced was, was, was at least tenuous. And so they're, they're working through all this. And what would happen is there was all these um, uh, uh, bathhouses and such. And what would happen, this one particular one, it's the, the, the pool at Beth, Bethesda. And uh, Jesus goes in there. And what would happen in these pools, this is really from like sort of the Greek influences. There would be, uh, if you were a, 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 an invalid or you were a cripple or some, you know, physical, physically um, impaired in some way, they would oftentimes take you out. You would be a beggar and they would take you out and they would set you out by the roadside where people would beg for food or they would take you to these bathhouses where you could sit by the pool. And a lot of times these bathhouses were next to hot springs or under, underground springs. And when the water would rush through, it would stir the water in the pool. And the legend was that if whoever got in the water first, they got healed. So you can imagine all these people sitting around the pool. And as soon as the water stirs, they try to rush into the water. And it's kind of like, you know, last one ends a rotten egg. What's well, worse than that first one in gets healed. So this is what they were doing. So this is what's happening in the, in the first century in, in, in these beautiful uh, colonnaded uh, bathhouses, these underground springs, and there's all these people laying around. And probably a, a modern day equivalent if you've ever been, well, I don't have time to get into that. So anyway, you get the picture. So Jesus comes up and this is how it reads in John 4. Sometime later, um, after he had uh, healed an official son, um, a military official's son, he goes to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals, which was common. People would come from all over to attend these festivals. And he goes to this pool, the Sheep's Gate, at a pool called Bethesda. And there was a great number of disabled people. They were lying there, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And there was one he saw who had been an invalid for 38 years. So he walks up and you can imagine Jesus walking through and he sees all these people and he spots one guy and he's sitting there, uh, maybe up against one of the columns and he's got his mat because it would usually be brought on a mat and they would lay them there um, for 38 years, for 38 years. And this is the account we have in John chapter five. We'll read this on the screen. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there, he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time and he asks him, do you want to get well? Now, what kind of question is that? The guy's laying there on a mat by a pool that he believes is gonna heal him if he gets in the water first. And Jesus says, do you wanna get well? Do you wanna get well? The man ironically doesn't answer the question. The man says this, sir, replied the invalid, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. I can't get there first. And Jesus' response is amazing. Then Jesus said to him, well, get up then. Pick up your mat and walk. Now, I try to play this out in my mind because it can't be just three quick verses. It says that Jesus learned that he'd been there for 38 years. So imagine Jesus walking through and some reason, somehow he, he selects this man. And I think he probably gets down. Hey, tell me, tell me your story. And the guy says, I've been like this for 38 years. Maybe, maybe he was 45 and when he was you know, uh, seven or six, something happened. And his family for a while helped him and took him out and helped him beg and they helped him for a while. But eventually everybody got older and had their careers and things they needed to do. So the best they could do now is just bring him and drop him at the pool and leave him there. And sometimes he might enter their staying a couple of days at a time because no one could come back and pick him up. We don't know what's happening, but this was not uncommon. So Jesus sees this man for 38 years, he'd been like this. He heard his story. He knew something about him for 38 years. He says, hey, do you wanna get well? Do you wanna get well? And the guy says, sir, I don't have anybody to help me get in the water. Every time I start to roll or scooch or whatever it is I do, someone else inevitably beats me there first. I'm just not fast enough to get there. I don't have anyone to help me. Interesting, Jesus is going, hmm, that's a problem. I mean, think about this. In fact, how many of you have done this with God, right? God says, hey, do you want to be different? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? But, but God, you don't understand. 
I've got this thing or that thing or this is happening or that is happening or this is happening. He says, do you want to be whole but you don't understand? And then when we start, we start to pray, God, if you loved me, right? Jesus, if you loved me, you would actually help me. Stop sitting here and asking me questions and help me get into the water. That would be love. I mean, can't you see yourself saying that? Can you see him saying that? I don't have anybody to help me. You're here. Why don't you help me? And this is how a lot of times we end up living our lives because we have all this stuff happening. We're just sitting there and, and he says, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? Do you understand the implication that you know what he says to him next? He says, get up, take up your mat and walk. If you know the rest of the story, the man gets up, he walks, he gets Jesus in a lot of trouble. That's another sermon for another day. But here's what I think is really interesting about this. What Jesus, and this is his message all along. For a lot of us, we sit down, we try to figure out what God wants us to do. And then we try to figure out all the obstacles that are in the way of us doing that. And we start praying against those obstacles. And maybe what he's asking you to do is just to get up and to walk with him from right where you are. Sometimes you don't need another thing to move in your life in order for this to happen. And I wonder if a lot of times that's what paralyzes us and keeps us from experiencing the fullness and the freedom that God has for you. He has made a way for you to be that. I'm not talking about being healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm talking about being full and free, even though we live in hard circumstances. I'm saying that there's a way for us to live where we are not a victim of the things that happen to us, but rather we live with a vision of being a child of the Father. Last week, I mentioned this, we talked about this. And I think it's very important for us to understand. When I talk about this idea of belonging to him and being a part of him, I'm not just saying uh, intellectually checking a few boxes, Jesus rose from the dead, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe this. I'm talking about what, what we learned and experienced last week when we saw Matt baptized, that there's this baptism, this immersion, this submersion into him that he consumes every part of our identity. There's nothing that we withhold from him. One of the scariest things that I've had to wrestle through is to ask myself, what, what would God have to take away from me to demonstrate this? It makes you start to hold things loosely because what you're doing when you hold things loosely is you're saying these things are better in God's hands than they are in mine. It has to consume. This is the language from Romans chapter six. And we looked at this um, last week and again in Matt's baptism. He says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. This isn't just about the parts of your life. This isn't about just how you identify with the life of Jesus. This is how you identify with the death of Jesus. We were baptized with him into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we also may live this new life. The new life does not come without first the death. And this is where a lot of us struggle with our identity. We go, I wanna be a child of God and. I remember I used to use Christian as an adjective. I wanna be an architect, a volleyball player, and oh, by the way, make me a Christian architect and a Christian volleyball player and a Christian this. And a, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's everything else serves this. For we like him, I'm sorry, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. The body, the flesh that is ruled by all these other things might be gone because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Anyone who has died has been set free from sin. We're going to talk more about this in a series coming up, but it's really interesting that when Jesus asks us, he doesn't ask us to figure out how. He doesn't ask the man to figure out how. He doesn't give him a more comfortable mat to deal with his circumstances. Hey, here's a mat. It's got some paisleys on it. This will be nice. It's a Lululemon mat. This will be really nice. (laughs) If you've taken yoga, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) He asked him to get up and to walk. I think what we have to understand is that, that we don't observe the life 
that God has for us by sitting back and taking notes and getting the information about that life. We experience that life by walking with him, in him. You have been made whole. The way you experience that wholeness is by walking with him in obedience. And I love the way Romans 7, uh, 6 continues this. In verse 17, it says, but thanks, he goes through this whole uh, list in Romans uh, 16, uh, 6. We looked at some of it last week. In verse 17, he says this, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance to rightly handle the word of truth. You have now come to obey from the heart. This is not like, okay, I'll be home at 11. It's not obedience from the heart. Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop talking about them. I'll stop saying that or I'll stop doing this. Okay, God, I'll stop that. And I know if you've grown up in the church, you've all heard this, right? I know God says to love them, but I don't have to like them. <laughs> nice try. He says, we gotta be obedient from the heart. You gotta, you gotta get in and do the work and let him do the kind of work to let those parts of you that you're holding on to, let them come to an end so that his new life becomes to a beginning. What I believe is this starts based on what we want the most, what we feel the most. When you believe and understand that being a child of the king is the most important relationship you have and you see everything else from that lens, it changes the way you see. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not a command that goes, if you don't do this, you're in trouble. It's a command that says, you need to make sure that you're wanting most what you want the most anyway. To be loved by the Father allows us to frame everything else we see in the future to see this. We wanna see him as he is and see who you are in him. That's the challenge, that's the quest in this. This past, uh, I wanna tell you two things real quick before we sing this song together. Uh, a couple weeks ago was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, MLK Day. And we always take on that day and I always read, um, I've been reading a lot over the last couple of years, but on that day particularly, I read one of his speeches. And I read it, because um, one is to understand it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's amazing the things that he said and did. It really is. We get sound bites and we have to read them in their context to watch him do this is, is something else. And I do this because I wanna enter into what it was like, to what it was like, what it felt like, to hear the, the intensity of the struggle and the battle that was going on when they were working so hard to bring equality and dignity. And so this past year, I read the speech, I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't know if you've seen this speech or not, but this is the speech that he gave the night before he died or shot, was assassinated. And uh, there's a long story behind it, but the speech is basically, he starts talking about this picture, this vision of what is to come. And he says in there, he talks about, he goes, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. It's almost prophetic. He says, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. And he starts talking about longevity. Everybody wants to live a long life, but that, doesn't matter to me anymore. And you know, what, you know why he says that doesn't matter to him? He says, because I've been to the mountaintop. He saw something that changed the way he saw everything in front of him. He says at the very end of that speech, he says, oh, we're gonna get to the promised land. I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. My question is, what have you seen in such a way that frames what you are doing right now that keeps you from being a victim? My father-in-law is 81 years old. He'll be 82 next week, Mr. Austin. I still call him Mr. Austin. I've been going to Mr. and Mrs. Austin's house since I was in seventh grade. Imagine middle school going to this, we weren't girl, me and Julie weren't girlfriend and boyfriend and we just went to their house and hung out and played and were goofy. And I can't believe they knew me in middle school and still let me marry their daughter, but they did. <laughs> And so I've known them most of my life. And, and so if you know Mr. Austin, Mr. Austin um, is 81, he'll be 82 next month. He is the quintessential old man. Like he looks the part, sweet as he can be. I mean, just, just I asked him, I said, Mr. Austin, can I, can I share this story? He said, I'm 81 years old. I don't care what you say. I said, okay. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so he counsels a lot of people. He meets a lot of folks. You always see him out in the... Um, uh, you'll see him out in the coffee shops with his Bible open either by himself or sharing what he's reading with someone else. I mean, he's an amazing man. 
And he loves the Lord, he walks with the Lord, and he is growing in ways that, I mean, he explains to me all the time. In fact, um, he li they live with us. Mr. Uh, Brendan Owens, they live with us in our house. We have a little a bedroom, an extra bedroom in the back. They live, and we share a kitchen together. And part of what Mr. Austin's routine is, is every morning he comes out and he mops from our kitchen all the way back to the little apartment. So he's got a Swiffer. He's not sure he mops. Every, like at five o'clock in the morning, every morning. So a lot of times I'll come in there about six or 6.30 and get coffee. Usually like one eye open, just trying to stumble in there, I'll see him. Sometimes he'll talk to me and sometimes he lets me be and I'll get my coffee trying to wake up. And one day he came over and he said, Mike, I had two cups of coffee actually. I got one for me and one for my wife. They're piping hot. I turn around and he's standing there. He said, Mike, I got it. This is like a couple years ago. I picked my word, pick my word. He always tells me about his word, my one word, pick my word. And he started in 2007 and he went through every word that he's picked. It's like six o'clock in the morning now, every word all the way through. And he tells me about what God's doing in his life. I'm like, the coffee's getting cold, but this is really awesome. So this will happen every once in a while. So a couple of, uh, probably three or four weeks ago, uh, Mr. Austin, I was in there, it was like Saturday mornings, about 6, 15. I'm going to get my cup of coffee again, you know, kind of in your pajamas with, and you're like trying to get coffee, trying to wake up and Mr. Austin's mopping, I'm trying to get in his way. He said, Mike, I picked my word for this year. I said, you did. And I'm, I'm you know, kind of listening and he said, can I go get my Bible? Now, when he says, can I go get my Bible? You better buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> his Bible is torn to straight. It's his, it's his day runner. It's his planner. It's his uh, uh, Rolodex. I mean, he's got phone numbers, appointment times, everything written in his Bible. And this thing is like used like nobody's business. So he goes and gets his Bible. He comes in there. He says, pick my word. I want to read this to you. And he starts reading to me. He says, and he reads all the, the surrounding texts and all the notes. He gives me the whole story behind it. And he says, Mike, I've picked my one word. And it comes from Psalm 92, verse 14. He says, they will still bear fruit in their old age. They will stay fresh and green. He is 81 years old and he is fresh and green. Do you know why? Because that's who God says he is. He says, oh, I'm no victim. I'm no victim. I live with a vision. My best days are still ahead. God's usefulness for me is still ahead. No matter what happens around me or to me, I am no victim because I live with a vision. It is not just a picture that compels us of a compelling future. It's a picture of who we are that gives us the courage right here, right now to live as one who has already been approved. I want you to pull out your card that you came in with. So we go, oh, where'd it go? <clears throat> he says, I am the victim. I live with a vision. I'm covered by the force of love. I'm covered in my Savior's blood. I am not a poor man. I'm no orphan. The kingdoms now become my own. And with the King, I found a home. There's a declaration, this song on the side that says, I am who he says I am. It says, I am who he says I am. He is who he says he is. I'm defined by all his promises, shaped by every word he says. I want you to look at this card and I want you to read this out loud with me. Are you ready? All of our campuses. I am who he says I am. He is who he says he is. I'm defined by all his promises, shaped by every word he says. What would it look like for you to believe that? What would it look like for you to believe that? For that to be true of you, to become obedient from the heart to the teaching that has claimed your allegiance. I want us to stand up and we're gonna declare this together and then we're gonna sing it together. And I want this to be sort of a stake in the ground for some of you because perhaps you've lived as a victim long enough. And the problem is you've just never been able to see anything more. Let's declare this and then we're gonna sing it together. I am who he says I am. He is who he says he is. I'm defined by all his promises, shaped by every word he says. Father, I ask that that would be true of us, 
that we would come to believe that, to trust that we would see that in such a way that regardless of our circumstances, what we feel, what we think, what is in front of us, the vision would be for who it is that you have already made us to be. God, I pray that that would be the tone and the sense that we get as we make this declaration, some from a sense of desperation and others from a place of victory. God, I ask you to do that for us. Use this as our anthem, as our stake in the ground to declare what you have done for us. And I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Yeah. 
All right, so this is what I, I want us to do. So every time you're out this week, you start complaining about something or complaining something, just say, I'm the victim. People look at you like you're crazy. And that'll be okay, because they'll say, what's up? So I'm the victim, I live with vision. I have a vision for what God is doing in me and what He's doing in you and what He's doing in the world around us. I am no victim. When you start doing that, can you imagine the kind of ripples that we'll get in our community if we all decided, every time we start that, we're just gonna say, I'm no victim, this didn't happen to me. I live with a vision. I hope that you'll see something different in such a way that, that gives you, that gives you what it is that Jesus intends for you to have His wholeness and His freedom. We are not victims when we live with vision. I hope that will be true for you. I hope this series has been helpful to you. We'll be down front if we can help out. Don't forget you can connect in the gallery. Thank you guys so much. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Martin.